going to talk a bit now about uh, the book Cree Narrative. It uh, was written mostly in the 60s and uh, then it became a dissertation and then uh, it became a book and then it became with the addition of four chapters of introduction uh, a second edition book. So uh, I think I'll start uh, with the question I was asking myself. Uh, I had these stories. I didn't go there to get stories. Uh, I was supposed to have a proposal. Uh, what kind of research I would do in a place I know nothing about and a people I knew nothing about. This is not a good basis for a research proposal. And uh, so I did a little looking, and this was 1962 or 3. And I thought, well, 295 years of mercantile capitalism, the Crees must be socially disorganized. So that was popular, okay. In those those uh, superior attitude days. And, and so I went off to... Wiskaganish to find social disorganization, and I couldn't find any. So I had a problem. Uh, I was also expected to study the Indians, but not the whites. Now, social disorganization, there were 12 whites there, ever disorganized, really, but that was something else. So I didn't know what to do. I went and I sat up at one end of town and drew a sketch map of the town, which finally made it into the book, and uh, worried about uh, what I was going to do with myself. And then uh, Willie uh, took me under his wing, you could say, and we went to start talking to people about the old ways, and then eventually John Blackman and the stories uh, showed themselves. And I was fascinated. Now, the sort of the uh, the key story there was not really, in my mind, uh, the conjuring tent. It was a problem. How would I present this without making it look bizarre or exotic? And so I thought, okay, uh, what we will do is we will make it about narratives, because I've got those, and I like those very much. And then we will insert this as a narrative taking place immediately, you might say. And uh, so I had uh, first to do the... Uh, the dissertation routine, what you do with the dissertation routine is that you write a chapter that shows, I know my stuff anthropologically, don't mess with me. Uh, you ever heard of Ambrose Bierce, The Devil's Dictionary? It's a satire, and his definition of abatis, which comes early in the dictionary, A-B, Abatus is rubbish placed in front of a fort to keep the rubbish outside of the fort from molesting the rubbish inside the fort. And uh, so that's what a first chapter usually is. Okay, And uh, so I, I didn't go whole hog on that, but I did do a little referencing and, and that kind of thing to show that I had some idea of what I was about. And then I talked about stories. And I read a bit, you know, folklorists, and uh, and uh, I guess some Hallowell. I don't remember now. It's been a while. And uh, so I wrote about stories, and, and I came up with stories 
having five main functions, which of course I don't remember now, but one of them was uh, as a vehicle. Stories are a vehicle to get you somewhere else into the the ideas and into the perceptions behind the stories. Now, we'll pause at perceptions for a moment. My interest by this time was uh, what I called and will call still emotional dynamics. Uh, a lot of anthropology and a lot of other things have been done with a very cognitive orientation. And uh, just speaking from experience, I'd have to say that cognition is not the only thing that goes on in my head. There's the emotional side of it as well, and it's important. Uh, and uh, in fact, it uh, just a slight digression can be life-changing, absolutely. I, I, I've been married to Betty now for 25 years, almost, 300 months, and uh, it is a life-changing emotional experience. My first wife was a very good person. We lasted a long time, thick and thin, 37 years, six months, and four days. Uh, my marriage to Betty is quite unlike my first marriage. Betty is, as you've seen, a warm, uh, welcoming, cheerful, even happy person. Uh, and uh, no residential school re <coughs> residue there. Unlike my first wife, who was sent to an orphanage as a young girl and so on, and had uh, hard times in other ways. So it, it was a life-changing experience. It continues to be a life-changing experience. I consider myself uh, hugely lucky. We had no idea when we got together that 300 months down the way, and I would add 300 bouquets of flowers, roses there being the 300th, that... Uh, we would last that long. I didn't think I would live that long. I don't mind. And uh, so, uh, you know, the chemotherapy was great. It gives me more years, unless something else gets me first. And uh, it's all gravy at this point. You know, I have a nice pension. I have uh, something I can look at and say, well, yeah, I did that. And the thing that stands out there mostly now to get back to it, is the book, Korean Narrative. Written as a dissertation, I had to have a beginning and I had to have sort of introductory stuff about stories. And then I had to make my way towards the shaking tent in a way that did not put the shaking tent up in a spookville somewhere. So I had to explain the attending spirit of the Mastavio. And I uh, had to explain what was going on during the ceremony, which, because John Blackman had translated it and explained it very thoroughly, was possible for me to do. And then I had to get in to the emotional dynamics behind that. So I dealt with attitudes, hunting attitudes. I dealt with uh, the attribution of love to animals that give themselves to the hunter and with songs and I'm um, probably leaving out one or two other things but basically with things that are primarily emotional in their medium of expression and then of course to wrap it up and uh, reattach myself to the uh, academic writings and uh, then to end by saying uh, the Crees have uh, many challenges to face and possible hardships, and we share many of them too. And so we do, and we'll continue to do. And, and there I could just let the matter rest for now. No timeline, no exit. And... Uh, I had uh, 
have it done in 1971. And I had started my PhD, well, seven years, okay? Or forget about it. So I sent Gertie off uh, with a tape recorder to uh, do some recording, be the anthropologist. Unfortunately, she became a housewife instead. Uh, but that's a whole other story we won't go into. And uh, a wonderful career. And uh, finished it by the skin of my teeth, airmail to my father who drove it over to Chapel Hill, who gave it to John Honigman within days of the deadline. And then sent it off to a museum in Ottawa uh, to see if they'd be interested. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, I need to do some smoothing out and changing and improving and so on. Oh, no, it's fine the way it is. Well, the reason was that this was a, a low-prestige press. They print 500 copies of something, and they can list it as part of their program of providing information to specialists. And so uh, by the time it got reviewed, by Regna Darnell, actually, it was long since out of print. But it did make some good impressions. Honigman said he regarded it as one of the great monographs of the North, which was a good deal more than I expected. And uh, Regna, who is not lavish with compliments, said he regarded it as a very important book for the reason that I didn't just give texts of stories, collections of texts. I talked about them. I interpreted them, tried to explain them, tried to relate them back and forth, which is <clears throat> what I did. And uh, then I didn't really think of it. And then McGill Queens called one time to ask me to review a manuscript for them. And we weren't here. My daughter Susan, third daughter, who did her M.A. on Cree tracks, uh, said, well, why don't you publish my father's book while you're at it? Oh, didn't know I had one. Send it on. So uh, we got the second edition. And uh, the Crees bought 200 copies, which made it, financially possible for the press and made it widely available in the Cree region. And uh, I added four chapters, which basically was Betty's doing. She said, well, why don't you just tell people what was Waskaganish like in 1963? You know, how did it sound? And so I did, you know, because it had a distinctive, it had a smell, it had sounds, it was quiet. Uh, and uh, so I could give, I guess we would say, the ambience of, of Waskaganish. And uh, that was good to do. It was easy to do. Didn't have to do any research. And, uh, and the Crees liked it. And uh, it's done reasonably well. And I still get enough royalties to buy a couple of cups of cappuccino. And uh, it's nice to know it's still alive that way. It's kind of a surprise, given that I thought it was going to be all finished when I sent it off to be examined. Uh, the examination itself was kind of interesting. At that time, Claude Levi Strauss was the bigwig, and I was not doing structural method. And uh, one of the people that got put on my committee somebody I did not know, had just published a little book on Levi Strauss. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to get a question on Levi Strauss. Why didn't you do a structural analysis of Cree literature? So I read his little thing on Levi Strauss on the plane on the way down to prepare my answer. Sure enough, he was right in there. And I said, well, I had a different interest. And uh, so then one of the other new members on the committee said, uh, but aren't you just talking about gossip? And uh, uh, another member of the committee who was put on, Dorothea Layton, 
said, No, he's just speaking from the field. That's why it sounds that way. Bailed me out on that one. And then another member of the committee who had been there all along wanted me to write a chapter on method. So I wrote to John Honigman and I said, you know, I, I might be able to write a chapter on method, but I can't tell you how distasteful this is at this point. My method is to think about it a lot. Well, John carried it through on that. I didn't have to write a chapter on method. Maybe I could have. Maybe I won't. <laughs> so the book made its way from a bunch of conference papers and uh, was uh, finished and accepted just after I got to McMaster on the promise that I would have my Ph.D. in hand within a year. In those days, they were very liberal about what they would require for a job. Okay? And I did. Made 300 bucks a year difference. Ha, ha. <laughs> so, okay, that, that's how it came to be and where it is now. The job was to set enough of a context in oral tradition to make that conjuring tent ceremony a part of all of life. And so I did that partly with stories about conjuring. And uh, conjuring has a somewhat narrow definition in the mind of the average reader, somewhat different from the way at least the old men and the old women there thought about it. Conjuring is an extension of human abilities, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, so its context is human abilities and events that happen to people that are remembered and made stories out of, some of them very old stories, some of them very recent stories. And so I put a bunch of those in there. And uh, one of the assessments of of uh, conjuring by older people there was it's just like little kids when they fight. Okay, the conjurer and his opponent conjurer and they're in competition which is a no-no but it's because they both feel they have some power, exceptional power. What do you do with power? You use it. It's like an atom bomb, okay? Uh, here we are with this bomb, what are we going to do? You use it. And so uh, conjuring can be used uh, to damage an opponent or a competitor. And uh, you, know, you get a story like uh, a man who, uh, whose son wanted to marry a, the daughter of another powerful old man. It's a true story. And his name was Mescano, which means path in Cree. And uh, the daughter was partly crippled. And so the parents tried, to, of both the daughter's parents and the Mescano, tried to talk the boy out of it, but love is love and nothing for it. But when they started out in the fall, she would be pulled along on the toboggan. and So they went through a winter together like that. And the young guy, being somewhat fickle, uh, decided maybe he'd made a mistake. Maybe he'd rather have one of her sisters. And uh, so Mescano went to the other old man, whose name I will not give, because there are many illustrious descendants of that man, and uh, told him the situation. And the other old man got angry. He said, it doesn't work that way. You can't just give her away like that. And uh, so they went their separate ways that winter. And uh, they had very poor hunting. And Mescano got to thinking about this, that maybe there was a reason for their very poor hunting. Maybe that other guy was conjuring against them. So he started conjuring against the other guy. And uh, this is all in the, in the book as well. <clears throat> and the upshot of it was that virtually everybody in Mescano's family died 
of, of hunger. And uh, the uh, it was attributed to uh, two things, really, to the conjuring against him and then his reaction to it. His response, when they were in pretty desperate straits, was to take a knife and slit a vein in his leg and catch the blood and say to the people there, everybody here has to drink some of my blood or we won't see things becoming green in the spring. When that happened, one of the son's wife, no, the wife of one of the sons, thought, things are getting bad here. I'm not going to do this. So instead, she went out, put on her snowshoes, and headed off with nothing. And uh, so the others died with one exception, who unfortunately, according to the woman and other people, uh, ate from the bodies of his family. And uh, she made it down to East Main Post. She had to uh, cross the river to get to the side the post was on before the river broke up because it was very dangerous at that time in the spring. But she made it, and uh, the post manager sent her down to a Skaganish and said, uh, if anybody comes in, uh, they may be cannibals. We to go. Uh, and uh, so you should hide her. Well, sure enough, uh, one of the men, one of the sons, uh, made it down and uh, gave a report of how they had starved to death. And uh, he was challenged by the manager, who was uh, part Cree himself and brave enough to challenge him. And then sent down with the manager's son as a accomplice, no, as a assistant, to Waskaganesh. And another one of his sons went ahead to warn them that this guy was coming. So they sent the woman up to uh, the camp, only about 10 miles out of Waskaganesh to the north, where John Blacknett's wife, not yet married, was living uh, with her parents. And they hid her in a, a minstrel hut. I don't know whether you know about those, but at any rate, it's a, a small mechwap, you could say, where a woman having her first minstrel period goes into isolation so that she doesn't contaminate anybody. Nobody would ever go into a minstrel hut then. Well, that's where they sent the woman to keep her safe. And uh, so, at any rate, the guy got to uh, Waskaganish, challenged by the manager there, denied it, and then they brought in the, the woman who confronted him. He went silent. They tried to get him to talk. Uh, they were a little bit rough physically with him. Then they called for old John's father to come. And John's father said, you have just one word to say, yes or no. Did you do this? The guy looked down. So what did they do? Why, they sent him off to Mr. Sonny, told him to behave himself. People were a little leery of him. After a while, he wanted to get married. The women were very leery of him, but finally he did. He had children. He worked on the canoe brigades. And on a canoe brigade coming down from Namaskar to Waskaganish, the Bishop Anderson was there with his family, including a small child. And they had a canoe upset in the rapids. And this man jumped into the river and saved the little girl and drowned. So, uh, there's conjuring for you. Uh, I got a lot of conjuring stories, and I put a bunch of conjuring stories under the book. And uh, it made it 
not a commonplace, but it made it much more than making one shaking tent in one community in one summer night. And uh, that it wasn't necessarily just a good thing. It might help you in finding where the moose are. It might help you, as they say, in predicting when the white men will come. Or it might get you in trouble. So like power of almost any kind, Monetary power, look at the U.S. president coming in. Very, very pleased with himself, shameless, and so on. That's kind of like old conjurers. Uh, and that's a digression I won't go off on. Uh, but it's a, uh, well, I, I will go off on it in a minute after I talk about something else but I'll come back to that kind of sense of power and entitlement in Cree tradition. It has to do with a case of incest. Anyway, the book. By going from the conjuring ceremony to the background of attitudes, songs, which were wonderful, and, and so on, the idea of relationships with animals, there's a chapter in there about that, which includes the love relationship, which Gertie told me outright. She said they believe the animals love them. Okay. Well, okay, let's make sense of that. Think about love in our own society. There are different kinds of love. Okay. The beaver woman, love was good. The caribou was just eager. She wouldn't do because when she got up in the morning, she got up with her hind end first, and he thought it would embarrass all his friends if every time his wife went out, she got up hind end first. You know, okay, funny, eager but funny. Okay, and and so on with with others of these. So it gave it a lot a, a wide context, a wide context, and uh, I think I also was successful in staying true to the intention of the stories, maintaining the, you could say, the integrity of what I was trying to talk about. And uh, when uh, McGill sent it to Toby Ernstein, uh, Morantz, to uh, review, she said, well, you know, this is now a historical document. It's 25 years since it was done. I don't think he should change the, the original thing. Let it be a historical document. That's why the four new chapters went into it. And uh, my thought was when I went back to it, maybe I'll be sorry I looked at this after all these years. Maybe I'll think, my God, did I say that? And uh, I need not have worried. I found that I thought pretty much the same thing about the stories now as I did then. That was a big relief. You never know. And because you do change, hopefully, grow improve your mind in some ways, make selections and so on. So it's okay. It's okay. I'm pleased and I'll stop there for now. <laughs>